Rajan, I think we should be ready to start in about a minute. Uh, I don't see Alan, but Alan, are you there? Um, I guess we're there. Right. So do we just get started in a minute's time? Is that right? Uh, we can get started in a minute, yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Good evening, B. Didn't get to say hi to you. Yes. Hi, Vijay. How are you? I'm doing well, B. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, nice to be here with all of uh, the other panelists. Sure. Thank, thank you so much for joining, B. And I hope you're continuing to enjoy Trivandrum. Yes. Yes. It's my, my second <laughs> home now. <laughs> all I need is an Adar card and I'll be, you know, officially <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just to be uh, uh, extra cautious, uh, uh, how would you pronounce your, your first name? Bien. Bien, okay. Yeah. 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 I'm Rajan. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Okay, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for moderating. Vijay, could you stop sharing your screen? Rajan, whenever you are ready, we can start. Yeah, I'm ready. So should I start? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, great to have you all here. Welcome to today's panel. Uh, my name is Rajan Singh, and uh, I'll be moderating and hopefully uh, make it possible to have a fun conversation. Um, any panel discussion webinar, the biggest terror and threat, <laughs> the, the fear that I have is that it will be deadly boring. So today we should even if you don't solve the world's problems, we should at least try to make it like fun and interesting. So I'll, I'll try my best. Now, um, let me, uh, so the, the format that I'm thinking of is I'll just uh, take a few minutes and, and sort of give some context. And then I would pose a few questions to individual panelists. And after, the, after, the, after that, you know, I would request everybody else to chip in and share their thoughts. And meanwhile, I'm told this is being uh, streamed live on YouTube. So there'll be some questions from the audience. And uh, as they get the questions come up, I'll pick those and also put it before the panel for the discussion. Um, okay, so let's uh, so let, me, let me just give some context. So in 2005, uh, which is 15 years back, I went uh, to Wharton for my MBA. And uh, at that time, that was the pretty much only way I could have learned from those teachers, the only way to access the kind of curriculum that Wharton Business School offered. Um, Today, uh, in fact, not just today, I would say for almost last seven, eight years, maybe more. Um, okay, I'll just one request, uh, some noise in the background. Uh, okay, yeah, cool. So uh, today, if you go to Coursera, uh, and I believe that has been the case for last at least seven, eight years, uh, the whole of Wharton, or at least substantial portion of the Wharton first year curriculum is available on Coursera without any dilution, like every single thing. In fact, ironically, when I was, I was studying there, uh, Wharton, uh, uh, in fact, in most business schools, the uh, situation is the same. So there are some professors who are very sort of, you know, high in demand. And there were guys whose courses I could not take after paying like, you know, $80,000 uh, tuitions. And today you can get the, the same courses taught by the same instructors whom I could not learn from on Coursera practically or virtually free of cost. So the question that naturally comes up is, you know, if the same professors are teaching the same curriculum, same, same everything, uh, does it make Coursera equivalent to, let's say, going to a Wharton or a Harvard or a Duke or a Stanford? And most people will say, no, not, not really. I mean, there is so much more that you get in these schools. So there is, there is a brand, there is network, peer learning, the experience of being there. Uh, and, 
and the selectivity the fact that these schools are they are not sort of sort of say you know catering to the whole world in their classrooms it also makes it a mechanism to select a few people who are really good at least as per certain metrics and and that is something which everybody else sort of values so which means a, a college or a university is not just about the curriculum it's about a lot more but i will i will put push further and you know ask a more provocative question even if you even if you put aside the brand network all those things let, let's put those aside let's just look at now purely the the learning part right the question is then purely from learning point of view even for, even with that sort of you know that a narrower objective is online or is coursera equivalent to what now to understand that we have to probably think about probably think about you know what makes learning happen you know why do we why do we need these colleges this expensive infrastructure do we need them if yes you know why if no why not right there are lots of lots of those questions and to to really unpack these we need to start thinking from the first principles about how did we come up with this this kind of system you know what was the so you know what was the evolution with which got here which is the the campus formats so on campus full time students are there they stay in dorms hostels whatever there's a huge infrastructure these are very expensive programs and and also now learning and research in universities it's all very very tightly tightly linked so this whole there's a certain way in which it is being delivered and it is exclusive very expensive and in many places very high quality right uh, but the question is you know okay if all this is good right but if you want to make this truly universal and and you could question if that's a right objective but let's say that's an that's a valid objective right to make it truly universal right uh what can be done so online learning was sort of you know the answer to that question that okay now you don't have to go to a wharton business school to learn those those 15 20 30 courses now it's available to you and and some platforms give it practically practically free of cost right but the thing was despite all that the online option was always perceived as a distinctive secondary unstatedly it was nobody said it loudly but we always assumed it was a sort of inferior option in some sense and therefore never a threat to wharton i mean after all harvard wharton stanford yale not just business schools you can take law school take any school all these schools they require huge amount of money to run so so and they have endowments and all of that so they need they need the money right like like any any organization so if the if putting the online courses was a threat to wharton or threat to harvard or threat to uh, mit they would probably have to think think twice because it would question the the fundamental model what that means is that even though the courses were put online even though we said that you know this is so okay so now this is sort of democratized everybody has access the fact is that wharton harvard stanford mit yale kellogg columbia chicago whatever all these guys they never perceived the that the online is going to be a real threat to their existence yeah? now here's the irony today because of covid and and this is hopefully a, a transient thing nevertheless today the same schools they are teaching online because you, know, you can't have physical classrooms so now think about it right so a couple of years back or maybe even one year back online learning was at some level classroom was at another level there was a big gap and therefore the assumption was look you know if you are really serious you want the brand you want the best you'll come and pay right but now if if you pay 150k tuition right and if you're still sort of uh, if you're still getting the online education then the big question kids will ask is students will ask is you know why am i paying so much you know i can get the same from coursera in fact before we start the discussion professor gulati also sort of alluded to it that you know kids are people are saying you know give us discounts right and the universities they need they need money because you know they are running a very serious not just teaching but a huge research infrastructure so there are some very fundamental questions and today uh, i'm sure we cannot answer those questions but hopefully hopefully we can sort of prod into and and maybe come up with some interesting insights so what what i plan to do is i'll just take uh, a few questions and as a sort of starting point for a discussion put those questions to panelists one by one and then post that post that you know just open it up so everybody can chip in share their thoughts point of views challenge each other hopefully come up with some fun discussion so that's that sort of in short what i'm planning and uh, let me first so first start with uh, professor rajshri because she is well all of us uh, we are uh, well not all of us many of us are talking about these things more as an abstraction but there's some of them some of you uh, i think professor rajshri is probably the the most well positioned that respect that she is the one who's actually running the whole technology teaching or at least sort of guiding the whole technology 
teaching and the infrastructure in Kerala. So, Professor Ashley, my question for you is, you know, at at one point we needed today, I don't know how many colleges, engineering colleges Kerala has, my rough guess is it might be around 150. I could be off a little bit, but let's say that's a number. So we needed so many colleges because education was a very localized affair. You needed to be in a physical classroom. Classroom size is limited. There is a certain student teacher ratio. Beyond that, it becomes difficult to communicate. So there was a natural constraint that you know one college, one classroom, one campus can only cater to so many people. So we had a requirement for such a large number of colleges. Now, the question is, you know, what is the, given the COVID situation, given that classes are online and the, this whole student teacher ratio, that paradigm has sort of, if not completely broken, you know, now you can, one teacher can teach 100, 200,000, whatever, depending on the format you have. If it's not very interactive, one guy can teach like literally a million people. Right? So there are, so things have changed. And the question in my mind and, and the mind of the audience, which is mostly a lot of them are students in, in colleges, is, uh, you know, if you look at the, the private colleges in Kerala, right? Uh, I'm not saying tier to tier, I'm not giving that tier name, but let's just call them private colleges, universities, which, are, so they are now, uh, they are teaching these students in, in say 150 odd campuses. And uh, now, now because it's online, we have individual professors and lecturers in each of these places, they are also teaching online. So the question in my mind is if it is online, why not, why do we have individual teachers in all these places teaching, you know, why would we not, or should we take advantage of what an NPTEL is offering or edX is offering or Coursera is offering? Is there a, is there a justification for, for us to continue this? So what we have done is we've taken the classroom model and just literally translated that into online. So my question is, is that the right answer or is there a better solution? And from your vantage point, you know, sitting as the VC of uh, Kerala Technological University, how do you view this changing? What are the changes that you want to bring in? So just over to you, please do share your thoughts on that. Uh, mute. Uh, thank you. Uh, distinguished panelists and uh, students and audience. So it is, uh, see suddenly in March when lockdown happened because of COVID, the semester was going on and immediately we had to switch on to online uh, learning met methods. So given the fact that not many teachers used to uh, these kind of uh, technologies for uh, teaching, it was a very uh, rapid transformation for uh, colleges under the university. And as you said, we have uh, 145 colleges which are affiliated to the university and it is uh, the you know, the difference between the various colleges with respect to the uh, faculty, with respect to infrastructure, with respect to the kind of uh, inputs that these colleges get, all these very, very, very much among these colleges. So having a uniform way of uh, delivering courses through an online platform where you, you don't have other kind of mechanisms to uh, engage students, it's not at least for these colleges, it is not the best option, I would say. Because I, I will never say that um, uh, online uh, teaching learning uh, can transform, uh, it, it can, those uh, mechanisms can come into uh, our colleges as it is. So it is true that we, we can have blended forms of learning where the knowledge or the contents which are already there and uh, learning those contents can be, uh, can, it can be in a common repository where everyone can learn from there, but there is much more than that that is required in uh, our, our systems. You know, mostly it is like students may require, they will have, uh, they are coming from different backgrounds, they will have different kinds of uh, engagements when it comes to uh, teaching them, learning them, uh, getting uh, output from them. This, this are, these are uh, very much varying. So uh, I would not uh, accept this fact and say that tomorrow the complete teaching is going to be online and we engage with Coursera and the courses are there and you get uh, those credits and we give you degrees. That, that will definitely not happen. But still, there are possibilities where we can transform, uh, transform slowly to these means where we align the courses used uh, in these platforms uh, to our university's requirements, our 
students' requirements and then use it for effective teaching learning. Of course, what is available everywhere in NPTEL or Coursera, the, the, there, is a, there is a large amount of content that can be used as such by uh, students and they can they learn on their own pace. But there are much more interventions as you can see the outcome of uh, learning. The, the, uh, see, it's not what you learn, but uh, what, how, what is expected of learning? What are the out outcomes? How the learning transforms a person? That is what we need to gauge in outcome-based education also. So in that case, it's not merely condensed, but engaging with much more uh, many, many other uh, aspects of learning, which will exhibit the capabilities of the students, the attributes, what are what have they learned, what are the skills they have obtained, and how, how effectively can we uh, uh, can we uh, design the see uh, see the formative assessments with respect to the learning process that is happening. All these are very uh, subjective, subjective as far as our students are concerned. That's where we need to be uh, careful when adopting online learning as such. And this, uh, in this situation, because we didn't have a second option immediately, we had to uh, switch over to these forms of learning, but still uh, teachers are engaging with students in uh, many other ways to see that they are learning, especially in an engineering program where hands-on, the practicals are very important. Uh, it, it is very important for them to come and do the designs uh, in the laboratories to take the readings then analyze those and then uh, see how uh, how things are actually happening in the laboratories all these are very difficult for us so that is how we uh, take it and but it's definitely as you said it is a it is a it is a path for us to uh, experiment alternative mechanisms for teaching learning and change the pedagogy and also the assessment and evaluation those are also important aspects uh, as far as uh, education is concerned. Then how do you design your assessments? It's not remembering, uh, if it is contents, it is just remembering and then uh, reproducing the contents for examination. Much more than that, how can you change the assessment systems uh, with respect to the modern uh, avenues for teaching and learning? That is something which we need to seriously look at it when we think of educational reforms along these lines. Okay, so uh, let me um, take a follow-up question or, or pose a follow-up question there. So what you said is that education, learning does not equal content. I agree, right? Learning equals content plus certain other things, which would be, let us say, interaction, there is you know, clarification, there is uh, problem solving, assignments, labs. I, I, get, I get that, I fully agree with that. So my question is still, I'll push a little bit there. If you just think about, okay, maybe it's a combination of A plus B plus, maybe, maybe you might say, okay, it's not, it's not like discrete, that's fine. But let's say it's some combination of certain things. The question I'm going to still push for is, let's say Vijay and I, we are both instructors and forget NPT, let's assume we are both part of the Kerala KTU system. We are, we are, he teaches at some university, I teach at some other university. We both teach microprocessors or some course. Now let's assume Vijay is you know, a phenomenal teacher. I'm a mediocre teacher. And, and it will be entirely likely that you know, if you have 100 teachers, there'll be a bell curve, there'll be some who are great, some who are not so great. And that, that's how human, that's how life is, we, we get it. My question is this, uh, why should my students be taught by, you know, I, as a teacher, like you, like you very rightly said, my job is not purely content. I'm helping them clarifying things, helping them do experiments. There's a lot of stuff there. Why should I be doing the, the core part, why can't we do that Vijay's teaching, the core teaching comes from him and I take care of all the, whatever you said, you know, all the other collateral or support, uh, support, so to say, in terms of learning. Uh, why is that not a better option? I, I'm not, I'm not dis disagreeing, I'm just posing it as a, as a you know, thought provoking question. I would not say that it's a bet, uh, it is not a better option, it's definitely a better option. But we do have some existing systems in place where a teacher is there, a group of students are there. If, say, for example, if I put a video of a, um, the best teacher in the university for a course, like say microprocessors, tomorrow students will say that, oh, that course is already there, then why should I go to that class? So that is, that is something which, uh, that's also something that we need to address. So I, but, okay, I, I agree. Yeah. So next question is, next question is, um, <laughs> Even Vijay is also teaching online. I am also teaching online. So right now, at least in the COVID situation, let, let's forget about the steady state. Like right now, we are both teaching online. So here's still the question remains, why not Vijay, why me? Yeah, that is, that is definitely possible. 
that is definitely possible because see here is it, is it desirable my question is is it is it is it, a, is it an objective for us is, that's it no it is it is desirable for a system which is completely autonomous uh, like uh, you have university a single university and then you have uh, uh, a few faculty members and you have some faculty members will be good at some subjects and then that can be designed very easily in such autonomous systems but in our case it's very different and we uh, we have uh, 140 140 colleges which are administered by different managements government colleges fine colleges and all but we need to have some kind of uh, uh, see some thought process has to go uh, when we bring in such schemes you know it is it is always possible to have a baseline material available from the university's part for the students to refer always but it's not by eliminating one teacher and that that teacher can customize that course for the requirements of the students that is that is how i would like to look at it mm. anybody wants to add to it uh, professor gulati i mean you are in academics and you have a huge treasure of experience would you want to share any thoughts on this I don't actually think we have the answers to your question yet. You, you've asked an excellent question and it has, it probably has different answers in different contexts, but let's put aside uh, the important context uh, that was raised where you have labs and you have to have some level of interaction. And now let's take uh, the context where it's a class, it's a big class where I'm providing information, but I'm not actually doing a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction, which we have many classes like that uh, across the university system. In fact, I think that's the bulk of teaching. Now let's say that I provide the information and I'm below mediocre and Rajan, you're mediocre and Vijay is just, you know, full of jokes and performance and uh, just much more entertaining. Uh, I think what we're going to learn in this upcoming semester is that uh, students who talk to each other across universities are going to figure out who the better teachers are for this provision of information. And then they're going to listen to Vijay's class and they're just going to open their screens on my class and have a blank uh, figure. And given that the, the material we're all trying to convey is the same, once they realize that they learn it better from Vijay in this, you know, truly awful circumstance where it's just hard to perform, they will all go towards him. And I, I think this has the potential to fundamentally change how uh, teaching occurs, at least in these information provision classes hmm. across the world. Um, so that, that's, uh, I think we already saw a lot of it uh, during the last part of the prior semester. We're seeing some of it during the semester, uh, the summer semesters going on now, uh, but universities like mine are trying to constrain this from happening. Right? We don't want students going to Vijay's class when we really want them to pay us. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to constrain the sharing of links and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think you've asked an intriguing question. Uh, I think that th the answers are not yet clear to us. We just need more data and we will have that soon. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so, okay, so next question I'll, I'll pose to you is that, you know, like you said, now the teaching is happening online and uh, uh, given the COVID situation, US, it's day by day, it's, it's definitely not getting better. We don't know where it'll end up, but it looks like this calendar year is, is, calendar year is probably, probably gone. Um, so then the question is, you know, uh, for a top tier school, so you are at Duke right now, um, 
what is what is your outlook so right now you you have uh, your undergrad programs graduate programs and these are all very exclusive hard to get in uh, and once you get in you pay a very high tuition i don't know what the number is my guess is it will be something in the range of 30 40 50 000 or 40 000 dollars per year so it's a lot of money but then when the kids come in they get this full service model uh, student teacher ratio is awesome it's very exclusive they are staying living together so it's a very sort of organic collective phenomenal learning experience um but as as we discussed earlier the one disadvantage of this whole thing is that it is the exclusivity is advantages for people who get in but a lot of people who don't get in they could also potentially benefit from this this high quality uh, infrastructure and the process and the whole thing that you've put together uh, but they are out of it because you know that's how the world was but now since things are changing and even those guys even those kids are learning online uh, do you see when this when the economy opens up and things are back to normal do you see a possibility that schools like duke or harvard or, or columbia or all these you know the, the big brands would they would they start thinking about a dual model where they have a high end expensive program which is uh, which is the current model and then a slightly not a course that type maybe like totally free or or almost free but something which is moderately priced but still not dirt cheap uh, so it still makes revenue but through that reach out to a much larger audience of students who were earlier going to a community college or a or a lower tier college so do you see that happening or do you think it will be sort of pretty much back to status quo once the covid situation is taken care of I don't think we're ever going back in time. Okay. I think this is this situation has forced us and I'd be interested in uh, hearing all of your perspectives since I'm uh technologically incompetent compared to all of you. But I think it this has as as an as an incompetent this situation has forced me to learn. Mm-hmm. how to use technology better it has also forced my students to get adjusted to using uh technology and getting uh you know you have to figure out how to get content from online teaching how to use it be- best as a student and the incentives to produce better online teaching are huge as you know we're all using zoom and if you look at zoom stock price it's a spectacular given uh where it was before so i don't think we're going back i i i think that you are predicting uh the future quite well i'm not sure if we will start providing lower cost education but i do think we will start providing a lot of online stuff supplemented by interactive material and we will try to get a larger set of students who we will seek to charge enormous amounts of uh, hmm. money to uh, despite our purported non-profit status yep yep uh, dr oliver would you want to share in your thoughts on this yeah um <clears throat> First of all, I just take a little bit of umbrage with you not mentioning Cornell in that list of great institutions. <laughs> my my apologies. <laughs> Please. Okay. So, uh I've been doing um uh, I taught at Cornell and also at Vanderbilt and I've been doing uh online for more than 20 years. And I find the conversation kind of interesting because it it presupposes in the early parts that somehow online's not quite as good as face to face and we've been through um a number of iterations in our own teaching and how we do it now we're very highly specialized we're teaching uh, primarily advanced uh healthcare to uh working professionals so it's not like K12 or a regular undergraduate uh in, um teaching situation but um what i think is that we've had a worldwide dem- because of covid we've had a worldwide demonstration frankly that what people refer to as online uh clearly doesn't work in the in the way that it's been presented to most of the students around the world and i think the students um were clearly ready to go online just watching my two grandchildren 
and their skills and interactive activity uh, with um, all kinds of educational um, things available on their iPads and what have you, they were, they were looking for something um, that was gonna uh, be better than the classroom situation. And what we've done with Zoom is simply taken, you know, a lot of bad classroom stuff and put it on video and streamed it all around the world. And I don't think that's the answer. So our view uh, is, I guess, a little bit different than what I've been hearing, but we don't think of what's happened uh, or we don't call it online anymore. We have to use that term, uh, but that's about three iterations, three modalities behind where we are uh, in, in our um, in our activities, we have something called the empowered classroom. <clears throat> and basically, we're trying to take learning and put the one to one learning uh, available that we've historically thought of as the best way to educate, right? One to one, prof one professor, one student, and, and put that uh, in, a, in a context in an environment where students have great access, they have a community. Uh, they're able to experiment and they're and we're we force, force them to reflect on what they've learned uh, and and do all this virtually and we're use, using um, you know huge amounts of technology to encourage that so our online classroom has about 70 different pieces of technology software that support uh, learning mm -hmm. so I guess my sense is that when most of what's going on is really where we were you know, 20 years ago in terms of trying to take a classroom experience. And we did, we tried to take the classroom experience and put it online, mm -hmm. didn't work. So mm -hmm. our students have forced us mm -hmm. to really uh, accelerate what we do for them. Uh, we don't have our, my average class is 30 people, mm -hmm. not 300 or not 3000. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a professor assigned for each one. Um, and uh, there's plenty of interaction, but a lot of the interaction takes place in a virtual environment, for instance, because in-app is, is helping with us with this. We have uh, intelligent avatars uh, supported by AI that interact with students because faculty can't do everything. And we, put, we let the student uh, control the learning as opposed to you know, a one, oh, let's take our greatest professor and video stream them uh, to a lot of students. I don't think that's, that may be education, but it isn't learning. So that would be my observation at this point. Fantastic. Um, so that's very, very, very interesting. Uh, BN, uh, in fact, by the way, uh, sorry, I should not be necessarily directing traffic. So you, BN, do you want to take a crack at it? And anybody else who has uh, any thoughts, please. Yeah, sure. As the as a futurist and educationist, it's my job on a lot of these panels I speak at to be the provocateur a little bit. Um, so what I say might be a little bit, um, you know, out there, but it's quite normal in what we're doing and what we're seeing on the ground in terms of real things happening. Um, I think when we're talking about education right now, we're actually talking about schooling, and those are two very different things. And the, you know, as the American author Mark Twain would say, uh, you know, never let your schooling get in the way of your education. And it doesn't matter if it's online, it doesn't matter if it's offline, if students aren't engaged, if they're not actually learning and they're not actually um, acquiring the skills necessary to do whatever it is they wanna do later in their life, in the real world, then what difference does it make? Now, in terms of the digital transformation, it is actually, um, you know, I've been happy to see the acceleration to moving online, but in order to move online in a way that keeps, student, um, keeps students engaged uh, and focused on actually retain, retaining knowledge and applying knowledge, there is still a huge gap. And you know, we've had in a lot of the incubators that we have, the startup um, you know, innovation schools that we have, we have, uh, you know, a, we have a lot of folks that come from MBA schools, for example, and they say, you know, they didn't really learn much and they learned more in like, you know, two weeks uh, in, in our incubators about the real world and how to do stuff than actually in the schools. And, and when you have now Google and Facebook saying they don't require degrees anymore, and folks like Elon Musk saying they hire MBAs despite hire people despite their MBAs, and Jack Ma of Alibaba saying that you know MBAs uh, you know are they have to reteach and unlearn so many things uh, when they get MBA uh, employees, and and so it's difficult. And so 
that is something that I think for us, when we were talking about schooling and online this and digital that, we're missing a bigger point. And that point is that we're, we're schools right now, the global schooling system, it is trying to move online at various different paces, but it's playing checkers in terms of the overall strategy, whereas the, the future is already here and it's actually playing chess. And so for us to think about navigating the future of uncertainty, yes, there will be more online, but the more important thing is, are we actually preparing the right content and moving in the right direction? Not just in terms of, is it going to be engaging? Are we gonna be able to track online performance and the nitty gritty, but more overall, the more of the existential philosophy of what it actually really means to be educated and to provide a quality uh, education. And um, I like to sum it up in, in terms of if you want to navigate the future, you need to have a map. And map I like to break down as an acronym. It stands for mindset, both in terms of the professors, the faculty, and the students. Are we, are we moving forward with the right mindset uh, and teaching and instilling that right, right mindset, not just for learning and getting your paper, your degree, but learning for life? Because what we, the biggest gap that we see, and we talk to corporates all the time, and we see that gap of what the workforce needs versus what the schools are teaching is the future skills and is the, um, the adaptability for uncertainty and the brace of uh, ambiguity. And so you know, the mindset, that growth mindset, that global mindset, all of that is really critical for how to learn, not just what to learn. Um, a stands for application, and that's bridging the gap between theory and practice and actually applied knowledge. From our work on the ground with students in schools and universities across the world and incubators, we, we found that the most consistent gap is in knowledge and learning is ap applying the knowledge that you learn in the classroom to your uh, own individual context. Um, and so that is what we found we've had to supplement with a lot of our, our tools. And P is the process, not just in terms of transforming content from offline to online, but in terms of the process of how do you actually get people to enable and uh, empower themselves through that journey, through school, through work, through life, and equip them with those tools and teach them how to learn and how to get information, process it themselves, apply knowledge. And so it's these types of, um, you know, so it's this type of, um, uh, you know, process that is really important. And I think that in order to talk about any type of transformation for the future, to prepare schools and to prepare students, we have to make sure that we're talking about the, the biggest missing piece. Uh, and so that's what, um, that what, what we're working on. And I think that it, that is a critical part of this equation. Okay, so I have a, I have a quick follow-up question. So, I mean, you, you talked about many areas. So now just to maybe to take, a, take out like one or two tangible things from what you said, uh, let's take say, uh, Professor Rajshree's domain. So she is a vice chancellor of a university which caters to pretty much the whole of technical education in Kerala. So in, in, in say Kerala colleges, engineering, let's take technical schools, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What are the one or two things in that specific domain which you would recommend that needs to be done, regardless of online and offline? That that's a separate dimension, right? So, in, from purely from the point of view of you know making the whole process more uh, more effective and more gainful, like can you make some specific suggestions which might be relevant for? Colleges? Yeah. So, from a lot of the the work that the communication and the collaborations we've had with um, in academic institutions across Kerala uh, and um, India the rest of India, is a consistent thing that uh, professors and faculty and even students have told us. And that is that, um, you know, the, the students, uh, that it's difficult for them. There's so many engineers that are being produced, but not enough jobs. And that gap is um, growing. And that anxiety that the students have that they communicate to us is growing. And, the, um, and so providing that opportunity for them to be able to seek out not just jobs, but their own pathway to the future in terms of job, uh, in terms of security, career, business is very important, as well as um, teaching them the social, emotional intelligence tools, the soft skills that are needed in real life. Um, and those are two of, um, of the, the consistent inquiries that we get in terms of how do you actually teach this? Uh, and so the technical stuff, you know, you learn, you can, 
you know, go to school, you can take a course on Udemy, but the, how do you actually put into place the necessary social soft skills, emotional skills, meta skills that are necessary to make you actually a whole person uh, and a well-rounded person, because that's what's actually gonna help you navigate this future of uncertainty. And so that is, those are the two things that what we've seen on the ground as um, big demands, uh, as well as the biggest gaps um, that people have come to us with. And what should be done? So, so can you make one or two specific tangible recommendations to bring in those meta, those you know, social skills and other things you talked about? Yeah, um, even the, I know bureaucratically, like with anything anywhere in the world, uh, changing a curriculum is hard and it takes a long time. Um, and sometimes that process can be quite uh, tedious. But I would say several things. Uh, one, what we've seen work on the ground and, and from our experience is if we can have more faculty break out of their silos and we need more conversations and a, a more communications between universities and the real world. So tie ups and relationships uh, with um, companies, with startup innovation. We're seeing more and more startup uh, entrepreneurship launchpad hubs being opened in universities, which is great. Uh, and we wanna see more of that, as well as more faculty who are open to uh, not just change, but more open to that, um, you know, to that professional development in terms of ongoing mentorship, as well as, you know, handholding the students through these real life experiential learning projects. So I would say increase in experiential learning. Uh, and a lot of times that uh, would be, um, you know, helped by greater relationships and uh, opportunities for students to work in the real world with companies. Uh, and that creates a recruiting pipeline. Um, and, and, and third of all, being able to add additional supplemental training on soft skills, on uh, meta skills, and future skills. Okay. Um, not to belabor the point, but let's say, let's assume there are already those courses. And, some, and I believe Professor Ashri can answer. I do, my outside and understanding is that there are courses on covering some of these things. And uh, there is, I don't know to what extent, but there is a certain amount of industry collaboration. Professor Rajay, I'll hand it over to you. So can you just just you know, share some thoughts on what you yeah, said? I perfectly agree with uh, what Ryan was telling, because it is uh, more of experiential learning. You know, the, the most serious problem I see is with the examination system. So the examination system is only checking what they have learned. But it, it is it, uh, the presently existing system. It is no way checking all all these aspect that that needs to be built into an individual. The so called soft skills, like the society skills, the future skills. None of these things are being tested in a written examination. So it is just storing contents and then uh, putting those contents in the answer sheets, and then it's it's done with that. But uh, we we do follow the Bloom's taxonomy where we are supposed to. Uh, look at the higher levels of learning. It's not remembering and understanding alone, but it is applying them, uh, creating that synthesis. All those kind of things are to be there and that can only be achieved, as she said, only if the uh, students are exposed to real world problems. Recently, there was an interesting uh, move from the government uh, stating that uh, see, there, there, is a, there is a scheme like uh, um, work as you study, program. So that is, a, that is definitely an opportunity where students can also do some uh, part-time jobs where if some companies are willing to come to the campus and offer some sort of internship for them, it's, it's a different experience altogether. They are really seeing how to collaborate in a team and how to use what they have learned and it, it becomes more purposeful. The learning becomes more purposeful. If such things can happen and it becomes a, a culture in the campuses, then this, this organic transformation from a student to a working professional will happen. So that is, that is what we need to look at and that is where this gap is existing. It is not that you complete all the exams and there are a lot of jobs for you. Some companies come and recruit 100, uh, 200, 300 of them, but it is much more than that. What are the avenues for me? Is there anything that is uh, 
that, that I can do for the society with the knowledge that I've gained? Are there interesting problems where I can apply the technologies I have learned, which will which will naturally lead to entrepreneurship and such things will happen. And also research. That is, that is also something that needs to uh, come out of uh, campuses in an organic manner. It's, it's not uh, that you go and uh, get admission for a PhD, but you, you during the course of the program, uh, see, even if it's an undergraduate program, you need to you need to do some research and innovate something, and you you find that there are a lot of other things that can come from these uh, principles that you learn here, and naturally a passion for research comes to that student. That is how uh, the a, a student naturally develops into a researcher or an entrepreneur or a teacher or any any profession can be shaped through this. That, that is how I would like to look at it. And the campuses should have the mechanisms for all these. And that is where we should also see campuses as, as different. It is not your, uh, say, if you're learning a computer science and engineering program, it's not only that you learn through a set of online courses and interactions, but, but it is how do you open up to other problems that are there in the campus, other departments. There are a lot of learnings that happen without your knowledge from the campuses. So, so switching to online uh, education completely is different from that perspective as well. Hmm. I think Can I uh, just interject one comment quickly? I'm sorry, go ahead, Vijan. Oh, no, I just wanted to add one thing uh, real quick. Uh, Dr. Rajasri brought up a really important point in terms of the incentivization for both faculty as well as students. Um, we, we hear a lot from students that they say they'd love to learn more experiential programs, but if their grade is uh, dependent on the actual standardized test they, and they don't have time in a day, in a week, to do anything except study for the exams, then they, even if they want to do something experiential or do another supplemental project or an entrepreneurship project, they can't. Um, they don't have the time or the bandwidth or the incentive to do it. And so I, and it, the teachers also in terms of uh, you know, providing these types of uh, additional uh, material. And so I think it's important uh, for us to start moving the needle in terms of aligning what uh, people really need to learn and teach with what they are going to be measured on. And I know that's going to be a slow process, but Dr. Rogers' point about incentivization is really important. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I just, um, uh, both the last uh, two have talked about soft skills and hard skills. And being an MBA professor in a classroom for 30 years, uh, I have a real problem with the definition soft and hard because uh, quite frankly, the more important skills that we really need to teach students uh, is what traditionally has been called the soft skills, communication, dealing with people, et cetera. And uh, career advancement is generally dependent on those as opposed to what we've traditionally called hard skills. Um, I think it's very easy uh, I think we should switch them. I think it's really hard to teach people those skills, communications, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, in a classroom. Uh, you know, I can, I can teach uh, a student how to calculate net present value for a project pretty easily. That's soft. That's easy. The harder stuff to give people the life skills is to teach the other stuff. And we are actually experimenting with how to do that. And we think that in a virtual environment, it's much easier to experiment and learn and reflect uh, in the virtual environment than it is trying to sit and tell people how to communicate with other people sitting in a classroom listening to a, a professor lecture for 45 minutes. So just a small point, but we think the virtual environment has great opportunity, not, not online streaming video, but really using the technology to its fullest extent has a much better chance of teaching the skills that are needed uh, than what happens in a classroom. Dr. Rajan, can I, um, you know, a couple of comments. One, um, you know, I, I, I completely agree with what Dr. Oliver said, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, we need to flip uh, hard and soft skills. My wife always says that, you know, the, you know, even though she's an engineer, she always says the arts are much more difficult to grasp you know, than the hard, you know, the physics and the chemistry and things like that, because those are very logical and, you know, you can tell them the path and people can follow it. So, you know, having said that, you know, I want to comment on what, um, you know, Bain and uh, Dr. Rajeshree said, um, you know, hands-on training, 
right, is such an important element of a good education. Um, you know, I can actually, I, what I want to give is from my own life experiences, you know, I have two children, uh, both of them went through the American education system. And what I found is that, you know, the hands-on training that some of the universities provide, um, you know, for example, certain universities have a undergraduate research opportunities, like, um, you know, they call it Europe, for example, where starting from the freshman year, as soon as you walk in, you know, they actually encourage you to do research. Uh, that means you can sign up, you can walk into a professor's office and say, hey, I'm interested in this area because I saw that on the website. And you, you start doing very fundamental. First thing that what they might ask you to do is uh, go clean up the lab, right? So you might start from very basic things to help the professor, but then you systematically build up on, you know, different topics which are interested to that particular professor and you build your research credentials, you learn how to think, you learn how to do that along with the coursework. So, you know, while I see, you know, this debate going on between online versus offline or brick and mortar or, uh, in organizations, it's very difficult to do uh, pure research, right? Especially in certain, you know, areas where you need lab uh, kind of hands-on things. But just to give you an example, one of the, um, you know, my, Again, going back to real life, my, my daughter was taking a course in bio uh, materials and, and uh, actually bio instrumentation, I'm sorry. Um, and the first thing the professor asked them to do is, you know, not a lecture, but said, build your own microscope, okay? So you, you basically are given a bunch of things, you know, they come with a brown, uh, you know, kind of a box and say, here are all the materials, right? Whatever materials you want from this, you can take, but build a microscope. Right? So it's a fundamentally nice way of thinking about it, right? You know, I'm an engineer, and sometimes I wish that some of the education I had was through this hands-on training where I'm making a microscope, right? And I built it from scratch, and it, you know, because when you do that, you, are, you identify several times, you know, all the mistakes you made, you build up on it, and that, you know, brings you to a com more complete education. So that is a very, very important um, you know, aspect and I completely agree with you know, uh, all the panel members that you know, when you think of education, there are much more things than uh, you know, going and looking at a course in you know, Coursera or any, any, any kind of um, you know, online system. You need to have um, you know, like the, a good mentor you know, interacting with you along with um, you know, this hands-on training. Mm. Interesting. Um, one sort of, you know, dissonance that I have is, you know, so uh, I, I love that we all agree, but I want to sort of, you know, artificially create some disagreement as well so we can have a debate, uh, which is that in the last few years, uh, I've been an entrepreneur and uh, I have interviewed uh, for, for recruiting, I have interviewed literally dozens and dozens and dozens of engineers or at least people with engineering degrees. Uh, Kerala outside everywhere. Um, and while we are debating that, you know, and, and I think these are very interesting debates about conventional education versus what it should be, online versus offline, how do we bring in other things? I, I, I get all of that. Right? But a guy who is starving, right? a guy who is not getting like, you know, rice or, or chapati to eat twice a day, talking about you know, vitamin D supplements and all that, you know, might be, uh, it's not, not irrelevant, but it is sort of not maybe the prioritization. We are, we are missing the, one of the core points. And the point I'm trying to make is that I have found that the quality of people is so abysmally shocking that, you know, it, it would be difficult for me to describe. And unless you have seen it yourself personally, what I'm saying is just sound like I'm, I'm sloganeering. So I'm not, I'll give you some specific examples. I've had people, uh, again, I'm not trying to run down anyone, but I'm just sharing some putting some facts on the table so that we have some perspective which we might be missing, which is that we have now thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming out of, well, not thousands, I would say lakhs of people coming out of engineering colleges in this country. And when, when I recruit them, I ask simple questions. So I ask, what's a discipline? Computer science, okay, fine. So tell me, uh, I asked one person like, um, so what language do you know? So, okay, I know Java or she, she mentioned some language. So I said, okay, so 
the compiler for that, uh, so I think it was probably Java or something she said. So I said, okay, so compiler for, uh, or maybe it was C, I don't remember. So I said, compiler for that language, in which language is the compiler written? It's also, it's also software program. So she said it's written in the same, same program. So I said, you know, how is that possible? And, and you can imagine that, I mean, I have had electronics engineers and you ask them, what is the, what is the voltage drop across a PN junction in a, in a, um, in a diode? Nobody, I mean, nobody has given the answer till date. Right? I, can, I can go on and on, but not to belabor the point again. But the fact is that in this country, and this is an India problem, so Sarah may not be able to relate to it. It's not a European thing probably. But the fact is, we are not even talking, see, we have not gotten to the level where we can say, oh, this guy is technologically sound and you know, his soft skills are missing. I would say awesome. That would be amazing that day comes, you know, when we're saying, yeah, this guy is missing soft skills, man. Then now we are like, you know, we just have this last, you know, last mile left. But most people, and it, I'm not saying it's a person's fault. Maybe that's how somehow we have got into this junction. And it would, be, it would be intellectually dishonest of me if I just agree with everyone and did not put this point on the table. And Vijay, I would ask you to agree or disagree or put your point of view on this. If we have people who are pretty much, and I'm using this word not, uh, not lightly, pretty much illiterate, right? With BTEC degrees and BE degrees and, and, and you can extend to BCom and, and any degree. So it's not about technology necessarily. We're talking about any degree, but I have, have had experience in, in technology hiring. If that is the situation, there is, so it's like the patient has cancer and we are, you know, we are quibbling over the, the pimple on the, on the skin, right? The patient has stage four cancer. And what I believe is that this is the opportunity to fix that stage four cancer. We can, we can do that or we can keep quibbling. We can say, yeah, the skin tone is not exactly right. You know, the guy should get some more vitamin D sunlight. Uh, and, and that I think is not the right answer. So uh, I'm not saying those things don't matter, but right, right now there is something much more pressing. And Vijay, I, will, I know you're not part of the panel, but I'm sure you will uh, indulge me here a little bit. Would you want to share any thoughts on this? Uh, Rajan, that was a bit of a surprise. I was hoping I can just listen in and not join. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to re really kind of keep this uh, question parked for the panelists to answer. But I do want to kind of agree with you on one thing, which is that uh, it is truly abysmal. And it is extremely frustrating to kind of see situations where uh, even very bad minimum expectations that one would have, given the disciplines that they have gone through, is just not there. So from a point of view of a person from the industry and as an expectation to someone, to, to folks from the uh, academic institutions, it certainly is a situation where we want to kind of up the game to be able to kind of have folks who are uh, at least reasonably kind of uh, attuned to what the industry needs. And the gap today is extremely large. And given the high requirements that the industry has, it is not enough that, I think you made a brilliant point here, it is not enough to actually have people who are really good, getting smarter and, and, and better, but really required to kind of move the whole benchmark up so we, you have a much larger group of people who are adequate for the requirements of the industry. But specifically on recommendations to that, I will have to give it a pass, Rajan, if you don't mind. If I could talk about that, that's actually something that we encounter. And what we've, what we've, what I'd say a lot is, if we're starting and expecting these issues to be resolved uh, in university, it's already way too late. These fundamental gaps and challenges that these people are experiencing that are manifesting in quote unquote functional Ill illiteracy um, or you know, low quality of uh, candidates, that gap starts way earlier. And that is part of what schooling has actually, um, you know, has shot itself in the foot is not paid enough attention to early childhood education and the earlier grades in terms of this uh, in, in, in changing and reimagining what education should be or could be much earlier on. These are fundamentals that people need to be learning uh, in primary school, in middle school, even by the time of high school, a lot of times what we've seen uh, through the research and through on, in, um, on the ground observations is that it's already too late. And by the time they hit university, it's already so ingrained to them. And there's no mechanism in university to catch those people that fall through the cracks and provide a remedial ramp up to accelerate and to get them back on track. And so the system has failed them their entire life. And 
what is required is us to look at and dissect this and reinvent that whole process and that system much earlier on. And that is, you know, a huge challenge in terms of funding, in terms of, you know, this, the, the, how the school systems are entrenched in what they're doing right now, but there needs to be that bigger push. Um, and that push is so fundamental for setting people up for their later learning years uh, and to, into adulthood. Um, and that us over, overlooking and underestimating the power of primary uh, education um, is w what gets us into trouble later on. Yeah, I'd like to add to that if I can. Um, I'm coming to this panel as a digital professional and an entrepreneur and, and a parent. And um, I've been kind of, you know, obviously the majority of the panel are educators. So that's you, your angle, me coming into this and doing my research to prepare really to have a discussion about education reimagined. What came up for me was the impact, the potential impact that artificial intelligence is gonna have on education in the future. And um, specifically in terms of how, um, I think there's a, there's a quote from Daniel uh, Kahneman, he said, there's no human uh, mental thinking process that technology uh, will not be able to do better than us, you know, so that's a terrifying concept and, and really what other people, you know, within that field looking into this area of education, they're almost saying that, you know, it's, you know, humans will never outsmart machines. Um, and really it's about the quantity, uh, where the quantity of knowledge is the standard, we will never win. So it's really just looking again at the soft skills of children, you know, from a young age and really kind of ensuring that, you know, they can learn to think critically, um, think humbly, you know, experiment with uh, creativity. Um, and it's really more about learning these skills rather than just filling their minds with knowledge. Got it. Thank you. Uh, um, can I just, it, your, uh, your uh, webinar here was talking about going back to first principles. And the first principle for me is learning. And uh, we often confuse teaching and learning and education and use them interchangeably. And from my perspective, they're quite different. Uh, and if you go back, you know, three, 4,000 years, I don't want to get too too far back in history, but uh, basically learning as we understood it, those uh, preliterate times has been hijacked by the bureaucratic uh, education establishment. And my sense is that um, the pandemic, which has forced us all to rethink all those things, will fundamentally reform education so that we'll get back to learning, but learning at a scale and using all the technology. So. I don't worry about, I mean, I know you have to do, you have to be careful about the, how you create an AI to make sure it's, uh, doesn't have systematic uh, and unintentional bias in it. Uh, but I think it's a, a wonderful way to get back to what learning is all about, but learning at a scale that we can't provide. And I think the pandemic will help shake the foundations of that bureaucracy that we call education, which really gets in the way, frankly, of learning. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Oliver. One thought I had was, you know, you are into, uh, you don't like the word online learning, but I'm, uh, I'm going to still use that just to refer to it. I mean, that's, that's not what you're doing, but you we have- would rather say virtual learning. Virtual learning, learning right, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, online's so, an old concept for us. Absolutely, yeah. So you're doing virtual learning and like you said, and one thing which really struck me was you said, you know, it's just, translating the classroom into digital, that's not the right approach. Think of, you know, virtual as the, the way I thought, I mean, the way I interpreted was what you probably meant was, let's say there had been no classroom learning. And if we just designed learning using technology, how you do it, that's what you guys are doing. So one question I have is uh, like we in India uh, and maybe people across the globe as well, I mean, the, the conventional teaching system, we could potentially benefit a lot from your experience and the way you have designed the whole thing. Is there a possibility of some kind of collaboration or something which would benefit people who are in the 
sort of the classrooms. Well, we're collaborating with InApp, so I'll just give them a little shout out uh, in terms of what we're doing. Um, but the, the, the basic way we start at is uh, looking at how the student uh, learns and how they best learn. Uh, we come at it from the student perspective as opposed to the what education does, which comes at it from a building faculty. You know, we got to have big buildings and we got to have rooms and faculty and what have you. So for us, you know, um, it's just the which uh, end of the telescope you're looking into. And, and uh, for us, it, we're looking at the big end going down to the student. So. And is there opportunities for collaboration? Yeah, I, I, we're a very narrow part of the educational establishment. And in terms of traditional education, I raised two teenage girls. And I would say, frankly, as long as there's teenagers, there's always going to be a place to send them when you get them out of college. You, you don't want them at home, uh, you know, doing their education up in their, in their bedroom. Uh, that there's still a, a role for the residential uh, college, as has been mentioned, they learn a lot more than just the classroom content. I, I went to Cornell. I can, I, you know, to be honest about it, I can't remember one thing that I learned at Cornell. <laughs> Hard to say. I mean, but I, I, I can't recall a lecture, uh, a piece of learning. I mean, I know I learned a lot and I know I've used a lot, but I can't recall any of that. Um, so, but I do think that what I learned a, a lot about was the other things that uh, those institutions provide. And, uh, but in the US at least, there, we're, we're seeing a big divide between the, I think the traditional, you know, uh, residential college for an undergraduate and what everybody's pointing at, which is continuous learning um, after that experience. And I think in terms of the graduate work <clears throat> and what have you, we're designing labs online. So the question was, can you do lab work? We're, we're trying to provide, we're not perfect at it. We're not there yet, but there's wonderful pieces of software that would let you build a microscope and see whether it worked, et cetera, uh, that you can bring to a classroom and students can do it one at a time. Where, where you know, learning in a big classroom or a big lab doesn't allow the student that ability to experiment. So we always talk about, so we're in the healthcare business and you know, if you make a mistake in healthcare, the consequences are pretty significant. So we're building systems to let healthcare professionals test without life-threatening uh, situations and they can experiment and what have you. And then we're asking them to reflect on what they've done. And to, to us, that's really getting back to the essence of learning, so enough said for thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, we have questions from the audience as well, so let me just take a few. Uh, one question from Anil Saraswati. Uh, the question is, how difficult would it be to design an online course structure that caters to students from different backgrounds when compared to a classroom environment? So I think the question is around, you know, we have a heterogeneous, uh, by definition, if I have a very heterogeneous group of people who are undergoing the exact same sort of, you know, learning process. So is there a way to, to better it? So uh, Renji, do you want to take this question? Because I think you might have some thoughts on this. Start with you, then maybe I'll pose it to uh, Professor Ajitri as well. Yeah, hey Rajan, I'm, I'm not an educationist, but the one thing I know, um, you know, from, uh, again, personal experience, you know, is, um, you know, I have, like, I have two children, um, and they're both very different, uh, right? One of them, um, you know, was born uh, very premature, and had, you know, and so his growth profile through college, through everything, had a very different uh, way compared to my second child, uh, who was a normal uh, you know, with respect to normal in terms of birth and everything. So she has a different, uh, you know, educational uh, capacity or profile. So it's a, this is a, you know, exceedingly important uh, question. And how do we make sure that, you know, as the, you know, like they say, as the tide rises, right, all the boats uh, should go up. Uh, so, you know, you have to design a system. And I think, um, you know, this, for example, you know, we know that, uh, you know, when we, as for a graduate exam in uh, US, uh, you know, when you took the GRE, for example, there are examinations which will, you know, it's not a set pattern, right? It depends upon how well you do that it, 
updates the questions which are going to be asked next time. Yeah. So I don't think, you know, when you, even when you think of virtual uh, classes, but I, I would like to clearly make two distinctions. One is, um, you know, where a professor on Zoom is teaching a particular course to the entire uh, group, right? In that is going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, compartmentalize. It has to be made at a general level, uh, you know, but when you talk about, co you know, things like Coursera or things which are already done and there is these breakout or discussion boards and things like that, that is where, you know, having a good support system, you know, like, for example, if it's graduate students which are driving, um, you know, some of the bulletin boards and the uh, breakout uh, uh, rooms, for example, it can be made very custom. You know, for example, if somebody needs more handholding, you can provide that. If somebody, you know, is very, you know, advanced student can, you know, brush over things quickly, understand everything, uh, they can move forward. So, you know, in, in that two, uh, it's like a, in the duality I mentioned, you know, I, I find it very difficult uh, to apply that in the first case. But in the second case, I think there are uh, technical solutions by which we can actually, uh, you know, bring everybody, you know, make it good for everybody. Uh, Professor Ashri, would you have any take on that? Uh, the question was uh, for a heterogeneous group of people, right? Is there uh, something that can be done which was, let's say, yeah, not is, possible? It's possible. Yeah. yeah, it is possible. It is uh, it is possible to customize these systems uh, in alignment with the needs of the learner using uh, techniques like uh, uh, AI and ML. It's like you can understand the level of the learner and then. Uh, give different contents. You can at, at every phase that that is possible. If someone has already done some uh, courses, they can skip some of the things. Then some more difficult questions can be given for uh, evaluating them. All these are possible in existing uh, uh, learning management systems and online materials. Also, it is possible. There are solutions for that. It's it's very easy to customize. Can I give you a practical example? Please. Yeah, so um, we, we're uh, building a system now, an AI system. So instead of thinking about taking a professor, you know, smart professor, our best and put them online, we're actually having them uh, look at where students struggle, which is the, the issue here. So we're building an AI struggle system. We call it office hours. So when's a college student gets in trouble, what do they do? They go to see the professor in the office hours. So we're building an AI system uh, called office hours that will detect when a student is having trouble with the virtual material and the AI with, you know, intelligent agents programmed by our faculty will intercept the struggle and help the student at that point of need, as opposed to waiting till three o'clock tomorrow afternoon or something like that uh, when they can get access to the faculty. So we're trying to do, one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring, et cetera, using AI, but at the point of need as opposed to some other point. And uh, so that's what we're, we're, our practical solution to that is to catch it where it's needed, program intelligent agents to help the student as much. Are we gonna help them with everything? Probably not, but at least we're making an attempt to uh, answer that question. And if I could talk about from our experience, yeah, so um, I can speak to what's worked for us uh, based on the data that we've gathered through thousands of hours and hundreds of, um, you know, students, entrepreneurs um, into the, the system that we've developed in terms of looking at what is the learner's uh, specific goals and then reverse engineering that process to look at where are they starting from and then how do we actually get there and to create a customized learning journey and pathway. And to start off with, you know, we focus on how they're able to best acquire and retain and apply that information through various types of a, a holistic framework of assessment in looking at what their learning style is, uh, what backgrounds, um, you know, they come from in terms of a, a socioeconomic context, um, a health context personality profile, as well as their strengths and challenges, and then filling in the gaps from there 
as well as smart matching them to the village. You know, it takes a village for each child, right? So for, for every learner, there's a village of support around them. And that's smart match based on their needs, their challenges, and their initial assessments. Because mentor A might be good for student B, whereas mentor B might be good for student A. And, uh, and, and, and so that is something that's what we found critical is that smart matching and looking at and defining their, their pathway through their goals and customizing it through that. And so what we've learned from the data, from assessing all of this data is looking at, um, you know, people tend to fall into certain buckets. Uh, and when we're able to uh, now take a look and, and start grouping people into buckets and creating subtracts for their path forward, we found this, you know, like any bell curve, is is good for works for a vast majority of the um, about eighty percent of our learners. Now the rest maybe they need more customization, um, or you know, and and so it it really sometimes it, it always needs to be customized. But once you're able to, what we found is that process works really well for us. Where do you want to go? Where are you starting off from? What are the gaps? What are the strengths? How do we fill that? And who? how do we build that customized village around you, mentor, coach, whatever support system to help facilitate each individual customized milestone? So that's that's something that has been built on a lot of iteration and trial and error um, over the years for, for in our context. Sarah, do you, uh, since you, uh, you, uh, you're in the AI uh, domain, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how a heterogeneous group can be uh, taken care of? Adding to what Dr. Oliver said, anything further you want to? I'm not really in the AI uh, domain, so to speak, just digital, uh, digital production. But um, certainly from my experience, when it comes to digital production, when you're producing anything from, you know, um, an e-commerce website to, um, you know, some big kind of application that has complex functionality. You're looking to automate, you know, when it comes to digital, you have to be able to automate. So um, customization becomes a lot more tricky because, you know, automating things means you have to kind of group a lot of things together and you end up with a whole load of results, which reality means you're not really making it that customizable, you know, in the end, because you have to group things together in such a way. So I think obviously everything is possible, but it's gonna be a challenge to deliver something that is genuinely customized um, based on current conditions, I suppose, current, current knowledge, it's all down to data and what data is gonna be available in order to work with, therefore to be able to kind of really deliver a truly customized solution. But at the end of the day, you're only, you, you don't have an infinite number of options as a result, you know? So, so I think customizing anything always does become quite a challenge. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens, but I think, um, a really interesting point again that came up for me is you know you you've all spoken from from the perspective of uh educators but you know there's a big um drive from big tech companies at the moment and probably for the last 10 years to partner with educators as well as you know health providers i think they've they've got kind of stock requirements to to double their uh, their stock, I suppose, within, you know, five years, their stock value. So, you know, they, they can really only partner with the likes of, you know, the big game that um, you've got defense and, and uh, you've got government, you've got health and you've got education. And obviously we're seeing a lot of partnering and, and, and move towards working with educators. So it's really interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see, you know, what comes from education through these partnerships with the likes of Google, with the likes of Microsoft, but then with a lot of the other, you know, smaller tech firms, um, you know, obviously there's other industries that have kind of taken a really big shake up in the last 10 years, retail, travel, news, entertainment, you know, all because of technology and education now, it's almost education's turn to, to kind of have a transformation. It's gonna be really interesting to see what does happen and, and almost, 
what occurs because it's it's almost two technology two two industries coming together technology and education so it'll be really really interesting to see what does happen over the next few years but i think it's going to be rapid a rapid change okay thank you um we'll take a few more questions sort of just we have uh, not too much time left so one qu next question is from babu k uh, and the question is to dr rajeshri um the question is in the present system all colleges under ktu are conducting online classes so the question is would it be would it uh, would it be better if ktu uh, conducts takes the initiative to conduct what is to conduct uh, essentially what the question is you know is, is it does it make sense for ktu to have a common platform through which uh, all the students from across colleges you know they get the same learning this is a question from babu k this this will not be possible for the time being it will not be possible only thing is we will be able to provide some baseline contents for some courses which everybody will be able to take say for example electives or so if we are able to build them in alignment with the ktu's curriculum otherwise it will not be possible with uh, within this time okay thank thank you dr ashish next question is uh, for i think it's for professor gulati which is um, it's about the teaching profession so uh, professor gulati some uh, i think question is from uh, from sham makes make sham surya and the question is uh, about the teaching profession how do you see teaching profession or the role of teachers in the post covid area will the role diminish will it change any any thoughts on that and and if i can add to that would you see a difference so let's say somebody like you or people who are again i'm not trying to flatter you but you know, people who are extremely accomplished and phenomenal teachers and then there is there is a long tail there right? so do you do you see again something changing there i i do uh, um i have a lot less experience at this than someone like richard uh but i i think his explanation for about their experience matches my limited learning about this. So right now the way a lot of our teaching works is that uh, it's separate from our research. And so we have sort of we have experiential classes for upper level researchers, uh, students doing PhDs or graduate level work. and those are different from the big lecture classes where we just provide information but uh in the current uh, model at least the online teaching that i'm seeing that's not going to work uh unless we try to engage the student better and combine it with the experiential part which uh, for me is exposing them to research uh, much earlier and having them do hands on work and uh, that that's difficult we uh, we're having to learn how to do that and learn from a lot of failure uh, to engage students and the more heterogeneous the student body is Uh, the harder it becomes i mean one of the benefits of having students on campus over a long period of time is uh, they move from being a heterogeneous group to becoming more homogenous because they learn from each other they sort of learn the context and now we're not having that as much and so uh, i think the task is more difficult but it, it it's exciting but bottom line i think teaching is going to is already changing fundamentally and people like richard already know that the rest of us are trying to catch up hmm. uh, if if i can just add oh, one uh, we just have a glib way of saying it so i spent you know 20 years in traditional academy i was the sage on the stage and what we're trying to do with our faculty is is uh work with them to let the student guide their own learning and so we we call it the guide on the side as opposed to the sage on the stage and i think that's going to be at least in my uh, limited area that's what's going to change for faculty you, you, you know um 
I think the big problem that we're struggling with here is what has been foisted on most of the kids in this country, this so-called online learning. It's just been a huge failure. I have two grandkids and of course they know that I started this university and it's all online. And they came to me very quietly and said, we don't like online learning. It's not, <laughs> it's not very good. We'd like to get back to the classroom. And it's because it was done so poorly, not because it was done so well. So I think for a lot of, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of the faculty will relate to this, but their faculty in the future are gonna be more guide, guiding uh, students in their own uh, experimentation and, and their own learning process. So that's a quick way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, there is one point of view that, you know, if in the, uh, in the sort of the new environment that we are in, and if some of it uh, sort of becomes a new normal, uh, then while the top universities in the US will do well, the smaller ones would struggle to attract students. And given that running a university in the US is phenomenally expensive, uh, uh, that's going to affect viability. And you know, it's like a death march for possibly for tier three colleges in the US. Uh, Professor Gulati, do you concur with that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we're already seeing that. Uh, um, at least in uh, the law and business school context, mm. uh, what I'm hearing is that, you know, enrollments in the business school context were already going down. So tier two and tier three schools were having difficulties. And uh, the same is true in the law school context. So they're sort of broadly professional schools. And, and I think uh, thanks to COVID and the, this significant change we're seeing both in terms of the economics of the broader economy and the change in education we're going to see a lot of uh, schools across the spectrum uh, suffer financially. I, I think uh, many of us were running um, very fat operations that needed to slim down. Got it. Uh, Dr. Rajshree, do you see a similar situation in the Indian context? You know, the tier three schools sort of on the death march, becoming unviable, having to shut down? No, I, I don't see it that way, but I, I, I only uh, see it as an opportunity for uh, empowering the present practices in uh, teaching learning. That is how I would like to look at it. It means more uh, digital uh, platforms and more online teaching learning uh, opportunities will be experimented by faculty members and uh, in, uh, in engagement in classrooms will be different. It will, it will not only be uh, pushing contents, but it will be much more than that because this is already proven that uh, the uh, standard contents are available in one place and students can look at it. But uh, the active engagement will transform because of this. That is how I, I uh, see this uh, transformation uh, post-COVID. Hmm. Okay, one more question here. So uh, IIT Madras has now introduced online degrees. Yeah. Um, so the other question I would have is when, now IIT Madras has started, is, I'm assuming that other IITs also will, will jump in at some point. And let's assume that we have all these major institutions in this country and possibly abroad offering these programs, which are not just like there are 75 videos and go and watch them. These are structured and you have to go through them. You have to go to physical center, write the exam. So essentially, the, uh, in terms of testing their knowledge, they would be just as rigorous as you would get in a conventional classroom program. If you assume that's the case, which I think will be the case, uh, would it mean, and this question I'll put to you, and again, I'll violate the, the panel uh, structure to even put the question to Vijay uh, as a recruiter, and maybe Sarah, since you're from industry. Uh, do you guys feel that somebody who has an online degree from a well-known university or school like say IITs or even outside India, would that guy have a distinct advantage over somebody who went to a conventional school, but maybe in a community college in the US or, or in India, let's say a, a private school, which is not that, that well-known. And, and would that result in 
private colleges getting lower enrollments and become and things becoming more difficult do you see that as a possibility or do you think it's it's unlikely uh, rajan for us when we go in for recruitment uh, what we really look at i mean there was a time when we started the company where we had uh, certain benchmarks uh, one of which was necessarily that the person should have a certain uh, qualifications which are indicated by the degrees a person has taken Uh, but more recently, and uh, also over time, we realize that uh, that is not what is most important. So today, for us, it matters less as to what exactly is the uh, person's background in terms of where he's gone for his education or the kind of form of education that he's taken. What matters more for us is what does he bring to the table. This could be in terms of the knowledge that he has. That could be in terms of the kind of attitude he brings to the table. This could be in terms of the kind of way he gets along with folks. so it's a whole package that we look at and uh, so it it really wouldn't matter but the possibility that you might get people who are far more brilliant would obviously kind of uh, you know in some ways have bad things to the background which they came but as a recruiter for us it really wouldn't matter uh, whether the person is uh, from a very prestigious university or not but I, but I mean, even in our conversation with partners we often state we should get a grad from iia why do we say that because chances we believe is higher that when you go for institute or university such as that the chances are better that you might get uh, you know brilliant minds to come in i hope that answers raj thank you thank you vijay so so we are sort of out of time so i'll just open the floor for any last last comments any thoughts from anyone floor is open yeah it's it's rick again i just uh, i've spent a lot of time in india and i've spent a lot of time on uh, the uh, rural poor and i just uh wonder what would happen to india if it educated bypassed all the traditional education and really taught a billion indians how to learn and participate in the global economy what would happen to india it would it would emerge as the leading country in the world if it could really teach its rural population to learn it's a phenom- phenomenal adding phenomenal thought thank you anybody else I, I think uh, Richard's point is the most exciting. This is Mitugalari. Uh, the the possibility to expand what has for a long time been exclusive, expensive, elite education is wonderfully exciting. I think uh, because the reality is that we're charging. these enormous sums by restricting access mm. and and this is also true as i see it in the iits uh and similar elite institutions in other parts of the world and uh, this horrible disease is uh, maybe the silver lining is that it will uh, democratize these exclusive pathways uh, to uh you know apart from education to economic success for me that that's that's very exciting even if it means uh, the demise of elite education that provides my uh monthly <laughs> salary right now no that's that's it's a big big thing you said appreciate saying that thank you thank you thank you mitu other panelists any any last last thoughts as we um reshift uh and reckon with where we've been with where we actually need to go especially in the wake of covid and and so many global challenges i'd like to end on an optimistic note one is that um i'm very bullish and i've say this a lot in in my speaking um that ai is actually ironically going to require us to be more human while it starts uh you know taking over the automated robotic tedious jobs that humans shouldn't be doing in the first place it'll free up our mind space and our heart space to actually do the things that machines cannot and that is going to require a new set of skills and so industry 4.0 what we're preparing and educating and schooling and skilling uh our 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 next generation for the future of work and the industri- next industrial revolution we need to think about what it requires to get people in there and that requires a cognitive revolution and how we learn how we teach how we educate how we skill and how we actually 
embrace the future rather than uh, be scared of it. And lastly, I'd like to think in terms of how do we actually problem solve and how do we actually create not just an education system or a schooling system, but an economic system that is regenerative, not just resilient. And, and if we're still talking just about building resiliency in the next generation, we're already falling behind. It's about regeneration. And this regenerative system requires everybody uh, to participate uh, at full capacity. And we can no longer afford to just have a small percentage of people with elite educations taking everybody with them. Uh, that is not the future. Um, and, the, and we need to focus on economic value and not superficial things. A GDP, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the stock market is not the economy, as we can very full, full, well, well see uh, in America. And th that is going to require us to completely redefine what success is and look at it from a larger ecosystems perspective. And that systems thinking is gonna be very crucial for how we approach design a brave new world going forward. Anybody else? Yeah, my, my belief is that uh, the elite institutions opening uh, their opportunities to all the students will definitely uh, make our teachers and also become very competitive uh, with respect to their offerings, how they uh, engage students and uh, how, how they can define themselves to be different from uh, these courses and attract students. So that kind of competition will definitely lead to more, more creative experiments in education. That's what uh, I hope mm -hmm. for. Absolutely. Ranjay, any, any, any last thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Rajan, you know, in, in, from the Bible, right, there is this thing called the Matthew effect, right, where basically the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You know, it's kind of an example of that, right? So, you know, the advanced technology, you know, for education and the, all the social distancing and everything we are doing, uh, one thing we need to be very careful that the underprivileged, you know, don't get pushed further down. I, I don't know exactly how to prevent this, but, you know, I think it's a very important thing for the educators, the good educators, uh, more, to be morally responsible, just to make sure that such an effect never happens. Thank you. Sarah, any last last thoughts? Final thoughts, not last. No, so it's um, all the, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just, you know, as I say, I, I came to this panel as, as really, as a parent, first and foremost, you know, my primary role. And it's just, it's incredibly exciting and equally terrifying, um, but mostly, mostly exciting to just, to, to just hear the conversations and just, you know, do the bit of research, look into what's happening in, in this space. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it's incredibly exciting times ahead for education. It's going to be transformative, no doubt. And it's, it's, for sure going to happen within the lifetime of my children's education um so it's it's really exciting and I, i'm thanking each and every one of you who are playing part in that transformation thank you dr oliver well i was just going to say you know uh, from a geopolitical economic perspective the 19th century was the british century the 20th century was the american century but if you can bring learning technologies to rural india Yep. then the 21st century belongs to India. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, take a minute for my closing thought. Um, I went to Wharton for my MBA. It's the arguably one of the world's top finance schools. I learned valuation and I did hardcore finance. I love, used to love finance. I don't do it now, but that was my passion. I went to one course, which was, which I didn't really like that much. It was very technical. Then I took another course, sort of, unofficially. And then finally, I learned valuation uh, because the second course, it was very good, but it was again a short three, three months. We can only learn so much. Finally, in all humility, I learned valuation online, completely free of cost from videos of Professor Ashut Damodaran of NYU Stern, which is a competitive, competitor school to Wharton. Uh, if, when I look at computer science, you know, David Mallon has a course, CS50, computer science 50 for uh, 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 on edX and on Harvard's platform. 
there are phenomenal teachers out there now we can the po the point i'm trying to bring about is that what oliver talked about uh, uh, sorry uh, what sorry dr oliver talked about was uh, making education available to everyone uh, renji talked about the same thing i think you know it's not a cliche i think the if i could learn free of cost and this this is an important point i could learn free of cost better than for something for which i spent 150000 dollars not 100 dollars not 500 dollars right i got that free i think i think you know we are there is something so valuable out there and we have taken some advantage of it but i think there is so much more that can be done and i do not believe you know we can uh, i appreciate all the there are a lot of nuances that you guys brought about i think all those things they 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 deserve full discussion they deserve you know our attention they deserve sort of you know working through some of those ideas challenges opportunities and so on but if i just take like a very layman you know very basic level sort of you know point of view i believe that the the fact that we have such phenomenal teachers out there and they are obvious by definition they are like small in number if we don't take advantage of that regardless of what are the bureaucratic hurdles regardless of you know how are like uh, i'm i'm really when mitu gulati uh, professor gulati has talked about you know the fact that elitist education is something which you know which is which has got constraints and he he earns his you know livelihood by being a professor at a at a top elite university um i think we need to look beyond what's good for us we need to look at we need to acknowledge what the right answer is and that answer might be uncomfortable and and so be it right the right answer doesn't become the wrong answer because rajan singh doesn't like the right answer that doesn't matter that's my opinion that's my my constraint there are certain truths which stand on and off their own that's why they are called truths and i think one truth is that uh, online education there are a lot of nuances i'm saying put those aside the core idea is that if you if the teacher quality matters there is ashwat damodaran's finance is what i'm not saying everybody sh everybody should stop teaching that's not my point but the point is that there is a phenomenal guy out there and we can learn from him we can learn from many other people like that and yes there is there's a lot of scaffolding required there's a lot of structure required we need to have labs we need to have support we need to have ta hours we need to have office hours we need uh, we need interaction between students we need uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of other stuff required but i'm saying all those things they are all different layers of icing on the cake if the teacher is fundamentally incompetent you can put as much icing as you want on a on a you know on a cake or on on a piece of you know on a mud right you can we can have seven layers of icing the cake is not that still mud and i'm not saying it in a humiliate i don't want i'm not trying to look down or say anything negative about it but that's a reality facts do not change because they are uncomfortable facts are stubborn things they stay they are here right now and we have to recognize this and the reason it is that i went to iit and i know that iit has got some good faculty i also know iit has got some small number but they have mediocre faculty now today we have 30 iits how in the name of god how can 30 iits in this country get great faculty it is not possible if that is not possible how will all the engineering colleges the government colleges how will they get great faculty if that is not possible how will how will you know i don't know 5000 colleges in this country how will god knows x 100 universities in this country how will they all get get great faculty we can talk about a lot of things we can talk about you know we can talk about all philosophical stuff but the fact is the teacher quality matters that i'm sure all of us we may disagree but we cannot disagree with that if teacher quality matters then we cannot have people who are who are supremely incompetent and who are not and who took up the job because they could not find a job elsewhere school teachers college teacher teachers you know ba teachers bcom teachers there are there are lakhs of teachers in this country and vast majority of them they should not be in that room they should not be in that chair i'm not trying to say that they should not exist their role has to be different they have to be they have to be tutors they have to help clear doubts they have to do there are there there is a lot of stuff to be done just uh, you know just showing a video or that's not enough i have fully recognized that absolutely there is a so but the point is we cannot ignore the fact that unless we unless we are willing to be humble about and acknowledge that the current way of doing things it is not going to 
meet the requirement that Dr. Uh, Dr. Oliver talked about, which is a billion people of this country getting great education in physical classrooms, forget it. Right? And if we, are, if we are saying we are going to make that work, it's impossible. It's, not, it's, not, it's impossible not because you and I, we don't have the desire. It's, the, it's like two parallel lines, they don't meet. I think we need to bend those lines and make them meet and we need to make it happen. If we don't, if we don't do that, we can do this debate. This, this, uh, this, is, this debate will be over in a few minutes and it'll be on YouTube. Nobody's going to care about it after some time and that's fine. But the kids of this country and the people who are in colleges, they are going to go through the same BA, BCom, BSc, BTech and all these degrees and nothing will change. And we'll keep talking, we'll keep philosophizing. And I think the time has come Philosophy is great, but philosophy is a, it's like a lighthouse. It shows a direction. Somebody has to walk in that direction. We have to take like five, 10 steps. We talk about it. Yeah, this is not a great place. Yes, this is not a great place, but let's move forward. And I believe that online education provides opportunity. What will it take? That's a, that's a challenging question. That's why we need these panels. That's why we need the dis discussions. And I hope that when we go back, all of us, we do something in our capacity to Make sure that you know affordable quality education in whatever shape or form is made available to, to other people. One thing which I'm doing, I run a startup and we are, we are now looking at online learning and seeing how we can help people learn better from, from even free platforms like Coursera, et cetera. You know, the, there are a lot of issues. People, they, they, they don't have perseverance. They, adherence is very poor. They'll watch a video for two minutes, they'll switch off. We are trying to solve that problem uh, as a startup. And we are seeing we are seeing phenomenal success. We have had seven, we have had ninety percent people sort of almost completing online courses, which normally has a completion rate of three to five percent. And what we are doing again, this is like a small. We cannot solve the whole problem. We can only solve maybe like small speck of the problem. So everybody, all of us, we are in whatever domains we are, we have to come together and and take some and take take the right actions. And those actions may be uncomfortable. Maybe some of those actions may threaten. Uh, I, I mean. I heard uh, Mitu talk about like you know uh, the the elitist system you know which is uh, which is you know, which is what you know sustains him and he's saying that's that's not the right answer or that's that's not the complete answer. I think we need to have that integrity, all of us, and and move towards what the right answer, not what's a convenient answer. Sorry, but I just wanted to you know be a little provocative and and not just end on everybody agreeing with everything. It's better to to disagree a little, but you know take some positive action. I'm, I'm very, very thankful to every one of you. Uh, let me thank everybody one by one. So, uh, uh, Sarah, thank, thanks, for, thanks for being here. Renji, uh, Rick, uh, Professor Rajshree, uh, BN, and, uh, and Meetu, like, and, and of course, Vijay, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, I've taken too much of the stage time. So sorry about that, but uh, enjoy the evening and uh, hopefully we'll meet again. And next time you meet, hopefully we'll have better updates to share with each other. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Discussion is an exchange of knowledge. In its root, every problem can be solved with discussion. I strongly feel that this very interactive discussion with eminent panelists has created new exciting perspectives and viewpoints to many. Thank you, Mr. Rajan Singh, for driving the session. You made the session interactive and interesting. Thank you. Bye. Without a doubt, the success of the discussion is on by the eminent panelists. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Rajeshri MS, Dr. Richard Oliver, Dr. Ranjit Kumar, Professor Mithu Bulati, Ms. Bian Lee, and Ms. Sarah McAvoy. I know for many of you, this is early morning, but thank you for making this event fruitful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Signing off, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, let's move on to the much-awaited event of this evening. The CSI INAP National Student Project Awards has been instituted jointly by the Computer Society of India, CSI, Trivandrum Chapter, and INAP Information Technologies to identify and recognize the best software project designed and implemented by college students across the country. Through this initiative, we provide a unique platform for young talents within the country to showcase their ideas and present their project to an expert group. 
thus enabling rich learning through interaction with technology leaders from the industry. This evening, we will be recognizing the best talent from across the country and I'm sure many of you will be anxious for the results. To begin the proceedings, I would like to welcome Vijay Kumar, CEO of Inap Information Technologies Private Limited to share a brief overview of the CSI Inap National Student Project Awards 2020. I welcome you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Akila. Uh, thank you, Akila. Uh, before I actually start off to talk a little bit about the CSI in-app awards, uh, permit me to first uh, profusely thank the panelists who have uh, provided a fantastic discussion today, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, Rajan, as a person who moderated this brilliantly, and uh, each and every one of you who was on the panel from Mithu to Dr. Oliver to Dr. Rajeshri, Bian Lee, Sarah, and of course, uh, the brilliant uh, Renji. So thank you very much for this, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for being here, for taking your time and uh, participating in the discussion. This is, I think, uh, probably a highlight of uh, you know, any, any, any event that we have done in connection with CSI INAP, and we're very, very proud of it to have been able to do it. Thank you very, very much. The uh, CSI INAP Awards was constituted uh, in 2012. This really started with the Computer Society of India having approached INAP for a sponsorship to start this initiative. And of course, a lot of my colleagues were uh, very involved with the Computer Society of India as well. At that point in time, it started with just three colleges in the city. And over time, it became popular with a lot more colleges across the state participating in it. In 2016, it took a, a more national level outlook and we had colleges and participations from people across, uh, you know, uh, from Northeast, South and West and it became uh, something which started to increase in numbers. This year, we had, uh, again, close to about 2,500 students who came in from 13 different states, uh, close to 100 different colleges. And uh, amongst them, uh, all, I mean, uh, and, and collectively there were about 571 projects which were evaluated. These are extremely interesting projects that we got an opportunity to kind of go through. A very impressive, very uh, accomplished uh, panel of judges uh, went through each and every one of them uh, meticulously. Uh, in the process of evaluation, which was, which was over multiple levels. And uh, across various technologies, which INAP works in from uh, artificial intelligence to machine learning, to cloud computing, to AR, VR, all of it. And uh, it was therefore for us also a very exciting and interesting experience to listen in on these projects. Um, do want to kind of thank uh, the the panel of judges and uh, in the webinar that happened uh, day before yesterday where we had the past winners of the CSI INAP awards uh, Thomas Telly and Arundhati one of the things that I think they mentioned was the opportunity that they got to interact with a very accomplished panel which really challenged them uh, which also helped them and uh, which 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 they benefited from in in many ways so thank you very much for the uh, for the judges uh, th thanks a lot to all those who kind of participated in the CSI INAP Awards this year. Winning is great, but participation itself is fantastic. The Computer Society of India and INAP are taking this up in order to kind of create a platform where we provide a lot more incentive and motivation to the student community to participate in good measure. I would certainly want to thank, uh, I, won't, I won't go through a whole list of people that I need to thank. This is, I, I would want all of you to understand that this is not a uh, easy exercise. It's an exercise that's drawn through a period of six months and has a lot of toil that goes behind it. And uh, from the Computer Society of India, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sabirish and the entire team. And from INAP, I would like to thank uh, Alan Joshi, who took the lead uh, from our side, and of course, a whole lot of others. And I must certainly uh, mention Biju, who interestingly was a person who was the Secretary of Computer Society of India in 2012 when he made the request to INAP. Uh, for sponsorship, and today Biju is part of INAP as well. So, and he's been, of course, uh, kind of a, uh, a very strong presence in this whole, in this whole program. 
uh, finally, uh, I would also want to kind of uh, uh, express in no uncertain terms the pride that we have and the good fortune that we consider it is to partner with the Computer Society of India. And as we move to the next year, which will be the 10th year, it'll be interesting to think how we can kind of go to the next level. I think the discussions we have today and the manner in which things have turned out online has itself been a significant step ahead. But one of the things that I think could be useful would be that while the uh, CSI and INAP are committed to the cause, I think it'll be useful to kind of enlarge this group of community which supports, this, supports the students. And I can see now there are brilliant people who have been through the experience participating in CSI INAP who today have moved on and are people who are very experienced and can now turn to be mentors themselves. So starting a community of folks who participate in this process who can then collectively move on to kind of support the student community is something that I think we should seriously think about and be well. And finally, to all the students, uh, we wish you the very best. And we do hope these uh, programs such as this uh, have been useful for you. And we thank you for your participation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vijay. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Shabarish, Chairman, CSI, Quantum Chapter to give you an overview of the judging process and the judges who made this event a grand success. Thank you, Vijay. Yes. Thank you, Vijay. And uh, 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 big thanks to all the people who have worked to make this event a great success. Thanks to the students. Uh, the, the submission statistics was highlighted by Vijay. It was around 570 entries from around 96 colleges. And choosing the best project from a lot of uh, uh, 571 was a very tiresome process. And the whole process took around six months from Jan to June. And luckily for us, we have got some of the very best people from the industry and academia who brought in an ex incredible depth of experience and expertise to our table throughout all the three rounds of the judging. At the first round started off uh, during Jan and uh, Mr. Biju and Biju Burgess of INAP and Dr. Vishnu Kumar was uh, the judges in the first round. And uh, from, from 571 entries, it was narrowed down to around 76 projects. And the second round was, you know, a bit tough and it was having an in-depth evaluation. So we had uh, four panels and uh, the panelists were, you know, Mr. Satish Babu, sir, Mr. Sumesh T.S., Mr. Anup John in panel one, Ms. Anusha Anand, Ms. Ms. Div Dr. Divya, Mr. Vinu Chandran in the panel, second panel, and uh, panel three, Ms. Anita, Ms. Rahul Chandran, and Mr. Mahesh KP. And the fourth panel included Mr. Anup, Mr. Rojar, Dr. Vishnu, and Mahesh Ravindran. The, it was a mix of you know, people from both industry as well as academia. And uh, I, I hope they had a tough time in identifying the best project. And finally, you know, on the, the, after the second round, for the final round, it was around, there was around 15 projects and out of which the, the winner was chosen. And I think uh, we are offering three prizes which will be announced by uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Rajshree Ma'am. So once again, thanks. Thanks for making it a success and uh, the panel discussions and all the deliberations, I hope will be a guiding light for the things to come in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabirish. The Thank judges, you. the judges were really vocal about the quality of projects presented in the final. They especially mentioned the amount of effort that each of these 15 teams had taken. Before we declare the results, let us see who these 15 genius minds are. In no particular order, I present to you the finalists of the ninth CSI in our National Student Project Award 2020. Just a second, let me share my screen.
first team project anti theft system for two wheelers from national institute of science and technology bermapur orissa next project machine learning integrated hero arm from coch institute of science and technology kochi kerala next project detection of wormhole attack in wireless sensor networks from ps modern college of engineering pune maharashtra next project crowd detection system from model institute of engineering and technology jammu jammu and kashmir next project an augmented 3d tourist guide from vidyavardhini's college of engineering and technology mumbai maharashtra next project natural language interface to database with data retrieval from sri chitradirnal college of engineering trivandrum kerala next project automatic depression level analysis using audio visual modality from pes modern college of engineering pune maharashtra next project is cold block from rajagiri school of engineering and technology kochi kerala next project self driving vehicle from model institute of engineering and technology jammu jammu and kashmir next project evaluation of teaching effectiveness by video stream from camera from model institute of engineering and technology jammu jammu and kashmir next project facial expression synthesis using voice tone analysis from ts modern college of engineering pune maharashtra next securing ehr electronic health record using blockchain from lakshmi narayan college of technology bhopal madhya pradesh next project automatic clinical report summarization system from rajagiri school of engineering and technology kochi kerala next project odi combine from st joseph's college of engineering and technology palai kerala and the final project ai birdy from sarvajanik college of engineering and technology surat gujarat and these were the final projects that we had now without further ado let us declare the winners of the 9 csi national student awards 2020 i would like to welcome dr rajeshri ms vice chancellor kerala technological university to do the honors and announce the winners welcome dr rajeshri ms thank you i am very thankful to inap and computer society of india for giving me this honor a second time last time also in a big function i was also part of the function in announcing the awards so let me uh, straight away go to the announcement uh, one second let me share my screen So if uh, I have some difficulty in sharing the screen, can you please uh, share the screen for me? I have some difficulty in sharing this uh, screen. Can you please uh, share the screen for me? The spe uh, special jury award goes to. Sarvajanik College of Engineering and 
Technology, Surat Gujarat. The project is AI Birdy. The team members are Arnav Bhavsar, Jamie Sheta, Jay Sonali, Neha Dadarwala, Neerali Nanwat, Smith Jivani, and Vishal Johan Putra. Congratulations to all the members of the team. It is from Sarvajani College of Engineering and Technology, Surat Gujarat. First runner up is Sri Chitra Tirunal College of Engineering, Trivandrum, Kerala, for the project National La Natural Language Interface to Database with Data Retrieval. The team members are Jacob James K., Gayatri Krishna, Kuttimalu VK, and Praveen G. Anand. Congratulations to all the members of the team from ACT. The best project is for the team from PES Modern College of Engineering, Pune, Maharashtra. The project title is Facial Expression Synthesis Using Voice Tone Analysis. The members of the team are Viran Pasalkar, Chaitrali Talekar, Sujal Chaudhari, and Rohan Hirekarur. Congratulations to one and all from the team B.S. Modern College of Engineering, Pune, Maharashtra. Congratulations. Congratulations to the winners. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajeshri. Now, we move to the final stages of the event. I request Alan Koshi, coordinator, CSI INAP Awards 2020 to deliver the vote of thanks. Alan, please. Uh, Alan will join in a few minutes. I'm not sure, but I think uh, Alan perhaps is having a bandwidth issue. Is that right, Akila? Hi, yes, Vijay. Sure, but uh, uh, let me just take that uh, small gap that I can get before Alan comes on to actually thank Alan because he probably wouldn't, <laughs> he obviously wouldn't do it himself. So Alan, uh, if you're ready to speak, uh, you can start, but let me just, uh, I was just providing the filler and the filler I was providing was just specifically to thank you. I think you just did an absolutely amazing job. 
I don't expect that uh, you will have the opportunity to thank yourself. But I want everybody who is listening in to understand very clearly that CSI and INAP has worked a lot, but this is one man who's going to talk to you, who's really put all this together. And he's put in six months of very hard toil. Alan, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. And sorry to everyone. Uh, I had a really bad data issue. We got a connectivity issue over here. So let me get back. So uh, let me just start off with by saying the most commonly used quote that people use to say to word of thanks is by Johnny Southerd. The only people with whom you should try to get even are those who have helped you. It is my sincere privilege and joy to have been given the pleasant duty of delivering the word of thanks this evening. On behalf of the CSI NAP National Student Awards, and on my personal behalf, I'd like to start by thanking the esteemed panelists who made this event ever so interactive and interesting. Many of you were in odd times, I'm pretty sure, but you have graciously, graciously accepted our request to join the discussion. I take this opportunity once again to thank Dr. Rajeshri MS, Dr. Richard Oliver, Dr. Ranjit Kumar, Professor Mittu Gulati, Ms. Bian Lee, and Ms. Sarah McAvoy for their wonderful thoughts. I'm pretty sure you have stirred some wonderful ideas in, into the minds of everyone who have listened to this. A special round of thanks to Mr. Rajan Singh for accepting our invitation to be the moderator of this discussion. Your experience in handling events like these have immensely helped us in, in the discussion to become into fruition. The nine CSI NAP National Student Project Awards was a six month process of filtering and identifying the best talents from the students. I sincerely thank the judges who was earlier mentioned by Sabir sir, who with their passion and immense knowledge helped out in choosing the best of the lot. A national level event like this of this scale would have, to, would have been only possible with the sincere effort of a large group of individuals who volunteered to make this event all the more successful. This was all in the face of a global pandemic right at our doorsteps. And we actually had to move everything into an online format. It would really be unfair if I don't thank each of them by name. Forgive me, because this could actually be very long. Thank you, CSI Trivandrum Chapter, for helping us host this event. Thank you, Dr. Shabrish and Dr. Vishnu Kumar for their support and helping out with all the aspects of this competition. Thank you, Kriba MR, Maya K, Akhil Sunny, Alan Joshi, Guy 3S, Arya S, Rohit R, Kevin John Matthew, Rahul Skaria, Anipama Dinesh A, and Akila SS for visiting different colleges across Trivandrum and helping us promoting our cause across the student fraternity. The beautiful posters that you see all throughout the internet and across social media handles were solely designed by Jodish Kumar. I cannot thank you enough for delivering such beautiful designs under all the under all under the already strenuous task that you already have. I take this opportunity to thank Shejo KK and Namida Girish from the multimedia team at INAP in helping out with the video editing and content layout. A special round of cheers to Bijay Krishnan in reviewing and giving you our valuable in inputs to all the design and content aspects. Like Vijay had mentioned earlier, we had well over 1,000 registrations for both the panel discussion and as well as the webinar series combined. This is primarily because of a very structured and planned marketing campaign led by Sunuja Raji. Special thanks to Arjun Ness, Binish Srikumar, Anish Srikumar, and Meg Shyam Surya for running the marketing and promotion campaigns. Since these were awards were completely online in, in an online process, we had a lot of support from the IT services team. Thank you, Roger, Akil J. Prasad, Suraj R, and Shyam Krishna P for setting our online services and helping us out. Quick shout out to Sunu and Rajesh KP for setting our materials in ease, our own employee management portal. Thank you, Rake Radhakrishnan and Rinisha R from the HR team in helping out by contacting our participants. The webinar series was an integral part leading up to the award ceremony. I sincerely thank Avishek V and Sangeeta S. Nair for spearheading the webinar series and making it so successful. I would like to thank each and every colleague of mine from INAP who had shared our posters and contents across the social media handles, helping us gain participants. You guys are really wonderful. Thank you so much. Right from the start of the process in January, uh, right up till June and July, I was lucky enough to have a team of exceptionally dedicated and reliable core group of volunteers who are up for any challenge I threw at them. From contacting students, sending emails, creating presentations, handling speakers, and whatnot. 
a big round of applause is in order for Shilpa Kes, Akhil Sunny, Alan Joshi, Supriya P, Kavya K, and Arun Shankar. I absolutely cannot thank you enough. The huge list of names mentioned here is further proof for the scale of people involved to host such an event. And we've always heard the term, save the best for the last. This competition would have been impossible without the help and constant support from two individuals. First is Mr. Biju Varghese. For the past many months, there have been very few days that I have not actually not called him twice for something. Could be regarding participants, could be regarding panelists. He would always pick up his phone and always be up for any challenge. A huge round of applause for Mr. Biju and thank you so much. Next is Mr. Vijay Kumar P, CEO of INAP. Even with, with all his back-to-back -back meetings and tight schedules, he was always there when we needed him, constantly giving us suggestions and points to make this event to, to the scale that we see today. Thank you so much, Vijay. Before I close, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being a part of this journey and supporting us and being here. Thank you so much. Hope you have, to, hope you have all of you for the 10th anniversary edition, hopefully not out of a webcam, but maybe something more in person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. With this, we have reached the end of the proceedings of the ninth CSI Inat National Student Award 2020. Finally, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to the audience who stayed on till the end to support the teams. Hope to see you all next year. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.